so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters this podcast was recorded on. It's July 2006 and Paula Magni gets a phone call from the police. There's maggots, lots and lots of maggots and they need her help. Paula grabs her handbag and rushes out the door. Her toolkit full of specimen jars and forceps and alcohol is already waiting in the car. When she arrives at the crime scene, she is confronted with a gruesome sight. A female body wrapped in plastic and then what looks like a doona and then some carpet. Despite the layers, maggots have found her. She's told that the woman's name is Inga. She's a sex worker, and they suspect her pimp may be responsible for her murder, but they can't be sure. Paula gets to work determining the temperature of the maggot mass, because when flies reach a certain age of larval development, they begin to generate their own heat. If she can work out how old the maggots are, she can find out when the woman likely died. Turns out the pimp in question was in prison when Inga most likely died maggots have given him an alibi. It's all in a day's work for a forensic entomologist. But it's not just maggots that can help us solve crime. Flies, spiders, centipedes, they can all reveal secrets from the grave. But Australia's bug whisperer, Paula Magni, is one of the few people in the world able to translate them. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. But this month, instead of looking at specific criminal cases, we're focusing in on the people behind the scenes of crime. Insects never lie. And in Paula's job, She is the person who helps translate what these tiny little witnesses have seen to help find justice for victims of crime. It's certainly a niche role. There are only about 250 forensic entomologists in the world, and only about five with Paula's experience in aquatic forensics. Paula, who is originally from Italy, has been living in Australia for more than a decade and currently resides in WA, where most of her work is in barnacles. And yes, even barnacles can help solve crimes. Paula has been bug-obsessed ever since she was a little girl, checking under rocks for ants and searching for signs of maggots in the chestnuts at her nonna's house. To talk us through all of the creepy crawlies from her career, she joins us now. Paula, are bugs and creepy crawlies something that have always fascinated you? Well, I'm always been in love, like literally in love with nature in any form, shape and size that was around me. I was uh, hiking on the mountains with my parents when I was three, taking rocks and possibly gems and sometimes some bones that I was finding on my way in the mountains. Or I was coming back home uh, with snakes or ants to put in the little pots in my kitchenette. And I was looking for little maggots in the, in the chestnuts when my nonna was opening the chestnuts for a snack. So yeah, I was just fascinated by observing what they do, where they go, how they act. And yeah, I think that was born with me. Was it always the plan, though, to become a forensic entomologist? Oh, God, no, absolutely not. Well, I actually didn't know what forensic was until later in the stages of my academic career. So what happened is that I decided to go for a very scientific high school. In Italy, you can decide to go for a path immediately when you are like 13. And I decided for this very scientific high school. And I was loving my time in lab. And I was loving everything that was about natural sciences. And not even just animals, 
but anything that was about nature. So rocks, plants, animals, stars, whatever is coming from Mother Nature. And when there was the time for the university, I decided to study natural sciences. That is this combination of biology, that is the science of life, and geology, that is the science of earth. So the idea is that, imagine a pot plant. A biologist will be interested in the leaf in the trunk. A geologist will be interested in the soil and the vase. But natural scientists can look holistically to all of these considering even the air around it, the stars that look at the plant and the people that look at the plant. So yeah, the idea of having an overview of everything was my idea of studying nature. And then later on, I said, I want to use this holistic vision to something that is applicative. And there was nothing that was clicking with me. And so I had a middle-aged crisis at 21, (laughs) pretty much. (laughs) And I changed my plan of study I removed astronomy and I put entomology. And one of the first classes of entomology, the professor said, insects are everywhere. And some people study insects because they are beautiful, like butterflies, because they're useful, like pollinators, bees, or because they are very harmful for whatever reason, like mosquitoes and bring diseases and things. And by the way, in the last few years, there is a group of entomologists that study insects that can be used for criminal investigation. And that was it. So that was just a sentence. Probably nobody was taking notes about it. But for me, it was like an epiphany, you know, boom, what is that? So, well, I'm talking about a few years ago, let's say that Google was not there. I don't want to give away my age, (laughs) (laughs) but Google was not there. So I ran to the National Library of my city and I was searching, what is this about? And I learned about forensic entomology, what is forensic. I found out that in Italy there was pretty much nothing about that. So I said, oh, maybe I can be the one to change this. We can do something about that in Italy. And I found out that there was an international society that was getting together in London after a few months. I said, okay, if I really want to do that, let me fly over and listen to the other experts and see if I can really fit in this world if I really like it, if it's really something I want to do, because I was not even into like reading Agatha Christie's books or uh, too much blood. I was not about that. But when I went there at the Natural History Museum of London, I guess it's the place and I guess it's listening to the expert. That is not just what they know, but the way they communicate their science, they passion and the multidisciplinarity between natural sciences, pathology, toxicology, different environments, people that are doing investigation in the sea, investigation in an apartment, investigation in a vehicle, or investigation in a vehicle underwater. Wow, that was it. I was done. You I was sold. done. I said, this is me. <laughs> I can definitely, hearing you describe it, see what pulled you in. It sounds so exciting, but was the reality of dealing with violence and dead bodies, did that take a lot to get used to? Well, the thing is that it's not like you see in the movies that you are part of the investigation and you have a forceps in one hand and a gun in another hand. You normally don't face the bad guy. You don't normally see the whole story. You participate at some stages of the stories. Very rarely you follow the whole thing and you meet the people that are involved. So I guess taking only a slice of the story helps in uh, the situation not to be too confronting. I mean, my first time on the scene was surrounded by firefighters and police and pathologists. There was this dead body that was there for not long, so was looking very real. And that was a bit confronting. But they said, well, that's not too bad. (laughs) The second time, the body was so highly decomposed, there was just bones and maggots and was really looking like what you see in the movies. It was not even looking like a a human body. I confronted at some point a perpetrator, a suspect then was considered the perpetrator at the end of the trial, and the perpetrator was younger than me, and I was like 25. And there was a bit confronting I had to say like it's difficult and I was talking to myself at some point saying what is going to happen when on the table of the autopsy I will have to work on a case of someone that looks like me like Mm. a young woman or a kid or something 
And that happened. A young woman that was pregnant five months with a baby and was extremely hard case. But at the same time, when you work, at least this is what happened to me, you kind of switch off from the being human, but you become a scientist that is more like in a box of objectivity and you do your job. And what you see there is a body that doesn't work anymore and there is something else happening and you work on that. I guess it's like being a doctor and being very focused on what you do, not just the human side of the story. That you have to find your way to put aside your feelings as a human being and just focus on your science because you have to avoid to be biased. You have to avoid to do anything that can put the case in jeopardy for miscarriage of justice. And I guess you're looking at these people, these victims, out of context as well. It's not like they're dressed in their homes and you can see what their life looks like. How do you work on them? Are they in a lab? Yeah, well, I had cases that I followed from the crime scene to court. And yes, you can see the surrounding of them. And to be honest, for me, it's better because I work on animals that modify their habits based on where they are and how they live. So if I have a maggot, even of the same species of blowfly that is in the bush or in a house, for me, it's interesting to see what is around because I can see what is was feeding on, if there is any drugs and if there is even lights on or lights off or what kind of surrounding area is in the bush or underwater. So you have to consider the whole environment. It's even better when you have that opportunity. And there are some people that work in this and also criminologists, so they kind of know what's the behavior and things. I try to not to jump into that simply to don't bias myself. So I try to be very objective. This is the environment. I don't care why the position is that or why. I don't care about the why. I just work on the factual things that I can see. You've mentioned maggots, so I think we need to dive in. (laughs) Give us a bit of a list of what animals you have worked with across your career. Well, forensic entomologists in general, they work on blowfly larvae. They are normally called maggots. They are the typical little worms that you use when you go fishing. However, (laughs) because the crime scene can be so different and the environmental situation can be so different, the rule is that you don't have to be biased on what are you going to work or what is going to be the key evidence of your case. So yes, maggots for the most of the cases, blowflies for most of the cases, but as soon as you move to aquatic environments, you can have mosquitoes, you can have beetles that are like swimming beetles that can modify the skin of the body looking like a shotgun on the skin. If you move to the sea environment, so the ocean, you will have crustaceans of different sorts. So you will have barnacles, or you can have macro scavengers like fish or other animals that are bigger, that do bigger damages. And you don't have only animals that feed on the body. You can have animals that just use the body as a shelter or the body as a transportation kind of mean. For example, barnacles, they're not interested in the body, but they're interested in the fact that the body floats, especially goose barnacles. So they attach on the clothes or on the shoes or sometimes on the bones if they're exposed. But then you change the type of subject that you work on. For example, I work in lots of cases of animal cruelty or wildlife forensics because when you're dead, you're dead. You are animal, you are a human. It's pretty much the same story. But one case, we worked on the stomach content of a brown bear and there was a firefly. And a firefly you normally will not find in the stomach especially. And that was giving us a lot of information because fireflies live in certain environments. So it will give us the information where the body had the last meal. The last meal was made of a poison bait. So we could backtrack where the poison bait was to get more information about, well, at the end, the person that did the poison bait and also save some of their animals because there were more poison baits around that area. I want to get into the nitty gritty of a few more cases because I think that really gives listeners an idea of exactly what you do. I want to talk about a case you worked on, again involving maggots. I promise we'll move off maggots soon. (laughs) Can you tell me about the woman who was found wrapped inside a carpet and how you worked on that case? 
yeah, that was an interesting case. It was an afternoon of, well, July 2006. So, yeah, I was just doing my business. I got a call from the police. Are you free? Because there is a case here. We need some help. There are lots of maggots. Yeah, come over. So, yeah, jump in the car. My car is always ready with a kit. And so I got to the scene. And, yes, there is this body. The head of the body was covered by a plastic bag, then was wrapped in a doona, and then was covered by a carpet. So several layers against the environment, but doesn't matter because flies, if they feel that there is the presence of something that is rotten, that can be their food, that can be the place where their offspring can survive and live, they get there. Moving away all of these layers, there was a river of maggots, lots and lots. At some point, when we have the highly decomposed bodies in temperate environments, so, so typically where we live normally, you know, not the desert, not the glaciers, we have at some stage what we call the maggot mess that can be like from a thousand to million thousands of, of maggots going on. And what is important there is that this amount of maggots they move around and they make their own temperature. So it's very important to understand what they do, how many they are, because the temperature of which they live is not the temperature that is in the environment, but is the temperature of the mass. So in that case, it was very important to get the temperature of the maggot mass so you could give an information about the time of colonization. Time of colonization is often very close to the time of death and then depends on situation. You can say that there is a bigger gap or a shorter gap. So long story short, I collect everything and I go to the lab, try to analyze the species and identify the species because different species grow different speed. So we give this information about this colonization time to the prosecutor. Problem is that in all of this working that you do, all of this work, it's not like the movies that take just a few hours. It can take days, it can take weeks because sometimes you have to wait for the full cycle of life of the animals to finish because you have to consider the adults for identification. So in that period of a couple of weeks, probably, the prosecutor had a suspect and the suspect was a person that was working for this. The person found dead. There was found to be a sex worker. This person was the, the pimp, the protector of this lady. And he said, I didn't do it. And when I went to the office of the prosecutor, I said, he didn't do it because Meg would say that she is there from this period. And in that period, this person was in prison. So the maggots were given an alibi to the primary suspect. Wow. So on one hand, I was happy to take away somebody from prison. On the other hand, the prosecutor was pretty upset because he didn't have a person to You put... took away his suspect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What about the case you worked on with a mummified man? Why were you called in for that case? The mummified man was found in an apartment of the city and the reason why he was found, because he didn't have any family, was because the local police knocked to the door because he was not paying some fines. <laughs> and there was a good reason because he was mummified for about 18 months. And the case was very interesting because he died for a natural causes, but the entomological assemblage, all the insects that were on the body, were extremely interesting because doesn't happen that often that you have such an environment. And we found this body pretty much transformed in a sort of threading noodles. And these mini noodles are the feces, the poo of certain beetles. They have a double intestine that can be, when they poo, they just leave these long threads. And they do that because Mother Nature is kind with them because they only eat very hard, coarse stuff and very chewy and hard things. So they kind of protect the intestine that way. But you can only find these after a certain time. So this case is really the forensic entomology successional waves 101. So a forensic entomologist work in two different ways. In a short time since that, you normally have one cycle of life, normally of blowflies, and you can work on that. When time passes by months, years, hundreds of years, we work in successional waves, so blocks of insects that succeed one after the other ones. And you don't have anything active sometimes, but you have all the leftovers, like the cocoon of something that flies away. 
or you have the remains of the feces or some little uh, legs and things. So even bits and pieces can give you information. In that case, there was this very mix and match of everything. And I worked in a similar case a few centuries ago because it was an archaeoentomology case. So, yeah, we can go from 24 hours, even less sometimes, because really when you have just blowfly eggs, it's a matter of seconds to be released. Or you can work for, yeah, to tank them on if you want. Paula, are you ever grossed out? Because you see some pretty nasty things. You see maggots, decomposition, eaten away flesh. Does it ever get to you? More than grossed out, I got frustrated. <laughs> Sometimes you have to work with some maggots that are called cheese skippers and they are jumping maggots. And they are very annoying because when they jump, they jump pretty high. So you try to work and they jump on your face. So now after COVID, we all have the shields and it's easy working with that. But back in the days, we didn't have any shields. So we really had to like avoid the maggot jumping on your face. And second, when I was doing my PhD, part of my research was about the effect of different sized maggot masses when exposed to low temperature. And in the life cycle of a blowfly that is similar to a, a butterfly one, when the maggot finish eating, they try to leave from the food and find a place where they become then the cocoon. It's called the puparia, the pupae in the flies. And they try to leave from the food because they have to find a dry place that is not maybe full of other animals coming over and etc. So I had something like 5,000 maggots escaping from my fridge because they were looking for a new place to live in for the next stage of their life. So the morning, you know, have a coffee, arrive at the lab, say, okay, let me do the job. And you see this river of maggots leaving from the lab and all oh, dear, what I'm going to do now? I'm going to scoop the maggots away. I had to do the experiment again. What do people say when you share these stories at dinner parties or <laughs> when you tell friends what you do? If I go to a dinner party that people don't know me and, oh, what do you do for work? I'm a biologist or <laughs> I just work at the university. I try not to start that because then they get pretty, you know, morbid and gruesome and they want to know about that. And then I get excited and I actually talk about that because I really love what I do. And then, yeah, it can become a well, one show party and I don't want to do that. So sometimes I prepare people try not to talk about what I do or just don't introduce myself as because oh, she's Paula, she's the CSI person. That is great, but come on, I just want to have a quiet night. <laughs> and enjoy your meal without having to talk about bugs. <laughs> yes, yes. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Barth. I'm speaking with forensic scientist Paula Magney, aka Australia's Bug Whisperer. You've said that the most challenging murder cases are when bodies are found in the ocean. Why is that? Yeah, that's definitely correct. Aquatic environments are very difficult to investigate. The basic reason is that we are not aquatic animals. So sometimes even finding the body is difficult. Reaching the body that we know that is somewhere underwater is difficult or is impossible. Sometimes we don't know what the body is. Hello, we lost the MH370. There are lots and lots of bodies there. And there are highly requirements in terms of equipment, people. You can't stay underwater for a long time. In theory, to do a crime scene investigation, you have to put the tape. How do you do the tape underwater? How you can block an environment that is underwater with waves and tides and things that move three-dimensionally? You have a body that goes down, goes up, goes in different directions. You're not always lucky to have the typical mafia corpse that is attached to a cement boots. Sometimes you have a body that is just there and floats around the water and today is there and tomorrow is not there. We had several cases in which a body has been uh, witnesses to be floating in, in a river and then the time that the police arrive or the firefighters arrive, the body is not there anymore. So where it is? And sometimes it's not just down in the river, it's down 
like in the depth of the river that is full of maybe mud, so it's entrapped in the mud. When you go in a lake, the muddy part of the lake, all there is the lake, more muddy is the bottom. You can't go there. You can get lost there. You can die there. So you have to think about also the safety and the risk for the people that work at the case. In some cases, you just give up because it's too hard and too dangerous for, for the people that work there. When you're lucky that you find the body, you can retrieve the body, you have guidelines to follow that are pretty hard sometimes. And the equipment is difficult to get. For example, the body bag, the typical body bag that is this plastic bag with a zip. Well, if you use that underwater, you will get the body and the water. So you had the special water body bag that has special holes with a mesh on the sizes so that you can get the body, but not the water. So when you zip the body underwater, you don't lose any evidence attached to the body. That can be the insects or can be the crustaceans or can be the key in the pocket or the wallet or sometimes pieces of the body itself, because longer the body stays in water, more opportunity for detachment of different parts you have. Okay, so you got the body, you retrieve the body, you add the body on the surface, what do you do now? The decomposition starts very quickly, because it's already decomposed in water, but the water surrounds the body in a sort of a fridge situation. As soon as the body is out, the decomposition goes super fast. So you have to be very careful about that. And then you have animals that come from the water. They want to come back to the water because they can't breathe outside of the water. So you have to be careful of getting everything there. And many organisms that are attached to the body when the body is underwater are not studied at the different stages of life. So when we work, we normally use the base data the research has been done before so we can compare what we have with the previous research. Not much research has been done underwater. So sometimes we really are the first one. So this is why many of my publications are about cases, cases happening in water, because the cases can help future investigation. So it's extremely complex. And even the diagnosis of drowning is very, it's one of the most complex diagnoses in water. But yeah, you find ways, for example, in the last few years, instead of focusing on the body, I am focusing on the clothes and the shoes for two reasons. The body get eaten or can be completely decomposed the clothes and the shoes stay there and can be a great shelter for the animals. The second reason is that it's pretty cool using the university credit card to go shopping (laughs) 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 for research reasons. So in one case, I had to go and buy 124 pairs of shoes. So we dumped the shoes underwater and we left them for about six months to see what kind of colonization that was going to have on the shoes. And then a few years later... After people thinking that we are crazy doing this kind of experiment, hey, a shoe allegedly belonging to Melissa Kadik arrives on the shore. And who is the only person that studies shoes? Eh, the shopping girl. <laughs> so you got called up to do the Kadik case. Well, that is also funny because the case happened in 2021. Western Australia was still law. So I could not fly to Sydney and Sydney could not send such an important evidence to WA. And I was heavily pregnant. So definitely I could not work on the case, but a very good colleague worked on the case and used our work, our research to investigate the case. Do you know what your colleague was able to share in the Caddick case that helped the investigation? Yeah, so one of the issues with the shoe was from how long the shoes was in the water and he used the barnacles that were attached to the shoes. Let's talk more about barnacles. What can they tell you about a dead body? Well, barnacles attach on things and are not present everywhere the same and are not present all the time. So the fact that the body moves in the water from place to place and at some point these baby barnacles that are pieces of plankton attach on something can already tell you where this attachment happens. So the origin of the body can be something, the origin where the body start floating around. If you have barnacles that live on the surface or you have barnacles that live at the bottom of the sea, can give you information about the movement of the body or if the body, for example, for a period was trapped in something underwater. Like if the body is down in a vehicle, you will find different barnacles that is the body is just floating. If the barnacles, let's say, look like seashell and 
you can study the shell from the chemical point of view to understand where the shell was made, what kind of elements of the water made the shell. So kind of not just saying from where the body started going for this journey, but also where the journey took. Because you can go from place A to place B from different direction when you are in the ocean. You don't use a street. You use just the space. And then it's about time. They grow faster or slower, similar to the insects, based on the aquatic temperature, the water temperature. So you can tell from how long the body has been in water. So what we call the post-mortem submersion interval, how long the body has been underwater, or the floating time for how long the body was floating. Again, depends what we find and things like that. So it's a good bunch of information. We've talked about how niche your profession really is. In Australia, which is where you live, context-wise, how often are detectives calling in someone of your expertise? Sometimes it depends on the situation of the case. It would be great to have my hands on any single bugs or any single case, but reality is that there are no pounds for every single case and not every single case is similar. Like there was a case a few years ago in which a body was found in a willy bean dumped in a river or a lake close to, to where we live here. So I was kind of waiting in front of the phone because the news were there. So they're going to call me, they're going to call me, they're going to call me. But in the 12 hours after the thing was discovered, a person came and confessed the murder. So, well, good for the police, for different point of view, and great opportunity for justice system not to spend money on another expert, not to waste time and things. So it depends on the situation. There is also a big call regarding cold cases. Cold cases are very complex, and there are big calls at the moment for people investigating cold cases. Can divulge more, but delve more into that, but I'm working on a few cold cases. So the work of the investigator is not just about the present, but it's also about the past. How many people around the world do what you do? Is there a rough number? Yeah, a few years ago, we did a survey and we were like 250, but not everyone that work in cases as well. Many forensic entomologists are forensic entomologists, research or scholars, and some others work for the police and they do just the you know assessment on the scene. So let's say holistic forensic entomologists are not many. Does that mean, in your opinion, this is such a new industry and there's so much more for people to do here? Is this kind of the tip of the iceberg in terms of how we can use bugs and barnacles to solve crime? I'm biased, so I would say yes, there is so much to do, there is so much to learn, there is so much to discover and to give away. There are some forensic sciences that unfortunately are considered to be you know, more useful, more key, more cool, DNA, toxicology, and things like that. So I know that there is more demand for all the forensic sciences, and this is some sort of issue that I have when I have students coming to me and say, I would like to be a forensic entomologist. What can I do? Or can you take me under your wing? I want to become like you. My answer is normally like, you have to be better than me because I do this. But the industry is that DNA is more important or toxicology is more important. New technologies are more important. Digital is more important. Artificial intelligence is more important and will be more important year by year. That it doesn't mean that forensic entomology is not going to be, but it's the time in which we had to focus on multidisciplinarity. It's a funnel of information. Like forensic entomology can give that, but if the forensic entomology is attached to toxicology, it can give you more information. Because I can, oh, this is a bug, this is the body, this is the temperature. Fair enough, the body is old, PMI, three days. Hold on, you didn't consider that there are drugs. So if you get the information from the drugs, you will find out that this drug affects the insect going faster or slower or become bigger or, slow or smaller. 
so that you can give out. It's actually two days. It's actually seven days. So all of this can give you more and more to provide to the investigators. So these pieces of puzzle can become more key. You say that your job isn't cool, but isn't there a CSI character based on you? <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, so the Italian version of CSI have like eight seasons with a character that is based on me and that I trained in the lab and I had to develop a lab for the story. Paula, I think that makes you pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, it's something that in the era of TikTok, I will have gone viral playing with the actress in the background. But yeah. I know as a teacher yourself, you're looking after and nurturing the next generation of people that are going to grow up to be like you. You have two daughters yourself. Do you think they're going to follow in your footsteps and become bug whisperers? At this stage, I have one that if she sees even a bat fly on the floor, screams like hell. (laughs) (laughs) So I keep saying that she's the disgrace of a mother biologist. The other one is more like into Frozen and Ballet. So I'm not sure what the future takes. Definitely, I will support them whatever they want to do. And I hope to teach them not much the good things, but what I did wrong for them not to commit the same mistakes. But hey, it's a daily learning curve for me as well. So yeah, let's see what it goes. Lastly, I just wanted to ask for those that listen to this and they're like, you know what, that sounds pretty awesome. What's your advice to them? What kind of attributes does a person have to have to succeed in your world? Ooh. Attention to details, for sure. Dedication, passion. And sometimes my husband says that I have more passion with my work than with my family. <laughs> but I guess you have only an, an amount of passion. <laughs> And you have to realize that what happens in a forensic context is not something that is related to the calendar year. So things that can happen on Christmas, in the middle of the day or the middle of the night. Once I went to a wedding and they called me while I was at the wedding. So I went on a scene pretty much dressed up as a bridesmaid. Luckily, Italian weddings are pretty long. So I was back for the cake. (laughs) And definitely thinking out of the box Communication and collaboration is all about a good balance between soft skills and hard skills because you can be the best of, but if you're not able to communicate with the different parties, and when it comes to forensic, you have different parties that are very different from each other. You have colleagues, you have students, you have prosecutors that speak low and you don't understand what they say. You have police that only take orders or they want to help you, but they don't know what they're doing. and You have colleagues overseas. I'm working on a case in Venezuela at the moment and they have 13 hours difference and they speak Spanish. So sometimes you're like, Google Translate, thank you, Mm -hmm. Google Translate. And yeah, I think stay positive and work hard. That you like what you do? I'm in love with what I do. And I'm very grateful that Australia allowed me to do what I love. Thanks to Paula for sharing her story with us today. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted and produced by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Scott Stronick. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. If you're enjoying our Behind the Scenes of Crime special, let us know. Leave us a rating or review in your podcast app or send us an email. You can reach us at truecrime at mamamia.com.au. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.